Well, tonight on Northern Exposure, we thought we'd make a departure from the norm, focusing less on the action and more on the personalities. With that in mind, I headed to Dunedin on the weekend to catch up with an English hard man blazing a trail in Super Rugby. James Haskell has slotted seamlessly into the Highlanders' setup and looks right at home with his new team and his new digs. And it's no surprise, given that Haskell is the ultimate rugby professional. Now, interestingly, you started playing at the age of 17, professional rugby at 17, so how did that come about? You know, I always had a big soft spot for WAS. You know, what a lot of people didn't realise was that I was a, a WAS fan, first and foremost. You know, when I was about 13, 14, my dad used to take me along to games, I used to watch WAS play all the time, and I would be, um, as Joe Worsley said, the big-nosed, irritating kid who would always come up <laughs> asking, <laughs> asking rugby questions. You know, post-game, I'd always come up and find Josh Lucy, Lawrence, guys like that, asking questions, what were they eating, what were they doing? At my last year at school, I went into it and I had a summer holiday period where some sort of, you know, guys are, are mostly enjoying themselves. I went and did a, a pre-season with Wasps, um, ended up doing the whole sort of uh, pre-season, playing two of the pre-season games, starting um, sort of finishing with uh, a game against Clermont Front in, in France. I was starting seven against Olivier Magna, Tony Marsh, Mercier, guys like that to name a few. And Richard Cockrell was actually hooker at the time for them. Um, so it was a bit of a baptism by far. I think we got, we got humped pretty badly. And then I went back to, to school rugby for a year and then on my 18th birthday signed my contract and I haven't looked back. Jesus, what are you, a bird? <laughs> <laughs> James Haskell is a man who knows his nutrition, five meals a day and all the right stuff. But the focus on health comes from an understanding of how tough the northern season is. It is, I think it's quite attritional, you know. Uh, in terms of uh, last season I played at um, Wassel when I played actually in Stade Francais because the top 14 is pretty similar. I ended up playing 40 games in, in a season. Um, which is obviously a lot of rugby. Um, you know, I was told pretty quickly that I don't want to do that every year or else you never last. I think in the Premiership, you know, because there's there's different tournaments, I think, you know, guys often don't, unless you live in one of the smaller places like Bath or, or Gloucester, you're not, you, you live quite far away from the club, so guys got to drive in every now and then and, you, and you're there for a set period of time and leave. You know, the thing I sort of had in Japan and here, you're 10 minutes away from everything in Dunedin, you can go there, commit to it, the boys come in, train, and then you, you have a lot of downtime. Um, whereas, you know, if you're living in London, I mean, it's a full-time occupation doing everything. Let's not dwell on 2011, James, but uh, I think it's fair to ask a, a couple of questions about uh, what unfolded and, and how you felt when you finally exited Rugby World Cup. I think it was a, it's a, it was a difficult period of time, really, because as a player who never played in the World Cup, you spend your whole time building towards that. It's one of your dreams, you know. What, my dream in rugby dreams are playing in World Cup, playing for the Barbarians, playing for the Lions. I'd achieved one of those, I'd missed out in 2007. So to finish with sort of that bitter taste where we'd underperformed, um, knowing that the guys around me, we had the talent to do well, and that the team and squad was good, that you know we had, that they could have gone on and competed. Uh, that was disappointing. I think all the off-field stuff was disappointing. I think that you know a lot of decisions were made that could have avoided a lot of stuff. And I think you know if I was to finish my career and never play again for England, I would be very disappointed that my last game was, you know, in the quarter-final of a World Cup when we, when we lost. So, Rugby World Cup aside, how does James Haskell feel about the rugby travelling circus? Yeah, it's taken me around the world, you know, I've lived in... I mean, it's a bit of a thing, I've lived in London, Paris, Tokyo, Dunedin, it's a bit of a. It's not quite the same um, well, company, mean, but yeah. it's not far off. We've got you know we've got a nice seafront. We've got a saltwater pool. Yeah. We've got some albatross colonies. Yes. Train station, a Cadbury's factory. I yes. mean, I don't, you know, I don't. I didn't find a Cadbury's factory in Tokyo, so. Play resumes. No, he did not find a Cadbury factory in Tokyo. But how's he settling into Dunedin, and how does he feel about his new side? Number 19, and that's James Haskell. You know, when you win in rugby, and, and especially. Um, a, a hard-working team like the Highlanders is. I mean, every team's hard-working, but I think you know, the Highlanders' mentality and the group of guys they've got, stuff like that is, is what's all important. They just want to see people turn the party line. You, know, you don't have to be a superstar. You don't have to be... As long as you turn up, front up, smash the guys when you can you get them, work hard, you're instantly uh, a, a brother in, in the Highlanders' you know, army. Yes, and the army is growing. James Haskell, rugby nomad, but uh, really, boys, I mean, he's... He is the modern professional rugby player. He will play for four clubs in a calendar year when he finally goes back to Wasps after he's finished his contract with the Highlanders. Uh, it's a pretty amazing effort. And he's travelling solo, so family, partner, all behind, and away he goes. Well, there's some messages and agendas underpinning um, his signing as well, both from a positive and a negative. 
Uh, it's clear that Jamie Joseph wants somebody with some extra miles on the clock who's got a little bit of maturity. He wants him to play six, lock up the short side on defence, bash people up and carry the ball strong, much in the same role that he is. But what does that say to the 20-year-old Scott Robertson down there in the development side or the next kids coming through? So the obvious arguments, Sumo, are, you know, it's a professional game. You get the man to do the job. But in reality, what does that mean for the integrity of the game, integrity of our development programme? So it's a very... It's a, it's a touchy debate. It's a controversial signing, in my view. Scotty, I mean, we're talking about a competition that wants the best players. Mm. Haskell is an international star. He is a man who's played at a World Cup. He wants to improve his game and hopefully add something to the Highlanders' game. How do you feel about him being here? Well, the, the NJ, if you've obviously uh, allowed it with having two in each franchise, that allows 10 across the, the, the country. In tradition, we've gone for a, an X-Factor player like a, a winger, like a Vulan Barker, or we mentioned Fato Sualo. For, for the Crusaders have they used previously that'll come in and provide that X Factor. Uh, but as you get there's a guy in two or three years that is behind the scenes wanting to come through and sees they're signing someone in his position. What do they do? They go to the Northern Hemisphere. But you gotta look at it, rugby's evolving. Uh, we're doing a story on him. You know, it's just a prime example of where we're at. And look look at the all the other international sports like soccer, the transfer market's huge. He could be the sign of the first person that's just doing it in rugby. And you know, with dual dual or triple contracts as um, a thing of the future. It's a way forward. I think, you know, whether you like the fact that he's here as an English player playing in Super Rugby or not, I mean, the fact is he must have taken a pay cut to be here when you consider he's had offers from French clubs to go back to France after his time at Stade Francais. He's come out of Rico where he would have been paid a lot more than the Highlanders could afford. Uh, that shows a maturity in this man to come back and want to improve his game in what he termed the best rugby cauldron in the world. Yeah, well also, and it also is a sign of maturity from the game because if you want to have a premier competition that people look at and they go, that super rugby competition involving South Africa, Australia and New Zealand has got, is accumulating very quickly the very best players in the world, well, you know, that does, that does an enormous amount for the profile, the marketing and the exposure um, of the game. And you know, it may well be that the ITM Cup is the place where we develop the younger kids, but we start to look at the Super 15 competition in terms of you just get the premier players in the world wherever they are, if they're available to yeah. play and prepared to play at that level of remuneration, then good on them. I think it's great for the game and great for the competition.